Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the first episode of the story in which Naruto is adopted at a young age. How far can he go if someone actually supports him? How will he influence the elemental nations? This story is from a riding bunny. Please support him, her. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. Council Chamber The Council Chamber of Kanahagakur sometimes tended to be noisy, but today its occupants were really outdoing themselves. Sarutobi refrained from banging his head on the oaken table and for what felt like the hundredth day today asked himself, why did he ever take this job? There must have been some reason, but it currently eluded him. I say, this cannot be left, as it is, shrieked one councilwoman or other thus roughly waking the elderly Hokage from his introspection. He sighed in exasperation, quietly, so nobody would notice, and turned his attention to the bickering bunch of self-important diplomat wannabes that made up most of the Council of Kanoha. Can you please speak one at a time, he addressed them quietly. Somehow they still heard him and turned their heads to him. But it never occurred to them to tone down the racket. Quite the contrary, now they seemed to have their leader's attention, they tried to present their respective opinions at the same moment. Naturally, none of them could be heard clearly enough to understand. Not that Sarutobi needed to hear their words to know what it was about. The tone of their speech had been enough of a giveaway. Silence, he snapped at them. Can you not behave like dignified officials? The rebuke made them to back off slightly, but they were quickly gathering courage for another attack. As I was saying, Hokage-sama, began a bolder one. I said silence, repeated Sarutobi in a more forceful tone. No matter how upset you are with the issue at hand, we have to discuss it calmly like civilized people, not shout at each other like a bunch of unruly schoolchildren. Understood? Nobody spoke, so the Hokage took it as a yes. Well then. Now if you please, I think Koharu had the word last. Thank you, Hokage-sama. His old teammate rose to her feet. Before I had been so rudely interrupted, she shot a pointed glare at the offender, I was pointing out possible implications of today's incident. Sarutobi somehow managed to keep the frown from appearing on his wrinkled face. That incident. What Kami did he piss of that it had happened before he could find another successor and bully him into taking the hat? As he kept one ear on Kohara's rant, he couldn't quite call it speech, his thoughts turned to what had occurred just this morning. Early morning chilly winds were enthusiastically chasing around dried brown leaves. Autumn had once again come to Kanoha and turned the forest hiding the village cheerful shades of yellows and reds. One little boy was sitting on a low branch, enjoying the contrast the bright colors of the leaves made against gray-blue cloudy sky, while trying in vain to forget the cold his frayed white t-shirt was doing an insufficient job of keeping out. Blue eyes scanned the village below. From his position near the top of the Hokage monument it seemed so small, like it was built entirely of dollhouses, and its inhabitants resembled ants. He loved this. View. He couldn't see their eyes from here. And they couldn't see him. Only a handful of people were out and going about their business, since the sun has just risen. Soon the streets will fill with the usual hustle and bustle of life, but so far only few merchants preparing for the day and shinobi going about their morning training routines could be seen. Hey, brat. Oh, let's not forget the last couple of yesterday's drunkards, who had yet to stumble into their homes. The boy startled and almost fell off his sitting place, but then quickly flattened himself against the tree trunk. Wide eyes quickly darted left and right from under messy yellow bangs. For a moment he hoped, that the two clearly inebriated men were speaking to someone else, but that hope was immediately squashed, as the pair unsteadily approached him. He quickly went through his options. There weren't many of them. Jump down and run? Though his branch was one of the lowest in the tree, it still was high enough for him to injure himself upon landing. Climb down slowly? It didn't seem possible to make it in time, the men were already too close. Stay where he was and hope they just came to wish him good morning? That didn't sound too likely. 
especially when he took into consideration the expressions on their faces. He had seen such before and he got the chills every time he recalled those occasions. He took the only remaining option. He started climbing upwards, small hands and feet finding enough purchase on the rough bark, trying desperately to get lost among the still thick leaves. Don't run, we just want to play, shouted one of the drunkards. Like I believe you, thought Naruto. He had more than enough experiences with their kind. He didn't even look down, concentrating instead on his escape. Hey, what are you doing, are you a fox or a squirrel? He certainly wished he could turn into one. Come down, or we'll come for you, added his companion, a bulky man with dirty receding hair. He was treated to exactly the same response. Don't you make us angry, or else, threatened the first one, tall and lanky. By that time the boy disappeared among the branches. But then Naruto stepped on a thin branch, shaking it so an old bird's nest fell of and landed between the pair. Okay, demon, you asked for it, proclaimed the other one, and started for the trunk. You shouldn't make fun of your betters. Naruto sped up his frantic ascent. When people started calling him that, it always meant bad news. He didn't exactly know why people insisted on treating him the way they did, but after being called Ninetale Brat for about a hundred times he was beginning to get a vague idea. Despite what many people claimed, he wasn't a complete moron. Now if he could just figure out, what exactly had he to do with the fearsome demon, but he had nobody to ask. And the old man with the funny hat refused to answer him, always changing the subject instead. The bulky man attempted to climb. But the level of alcohol in his bloodstream prevented him from succeeding. He picked himself from the ground, rubbing his sore backside. Now you've done it, you beast, he snarled. He took a few steps back and then ran towards the tree, slamming into the trunk. The branch Naruto was just reaching for Shook and he lost his hold. He tried to grab it again, but he lost his balance and started plummeting towards the ground. He tried to get hold on another one, but only hurt his fingers. The ground was approaching fast and he had no means to stop his fall. He closed his eyes. He hit something hard. It hurt like he just broke his ribs, but he didn't hear anything snap. Just be thankful for small mercies, he thought before ricocheting of whatever he hit and landing on the ground. He rolled a few times in the grass before coming to a stop. He opened his eyes warily. You bastard. If they were angry before, now they sounded furious. You hit Menma. Ah, so that's what almost cracked his ribs. The fat man, who was apparently named Menma, was lying on the ground moaning and clutching his head, while the taller one was slowly making his way towards the downed boy. Naruto didn't wait for anything, shakily climbed to his legs, all the while biting his lips to prevent himself from crying out in pain, and started off as fast as his wobbly short legs could carry him. He was quite fast for his age, lot of practice tends to have that effect, but unfortunately it wasn't fast enough. Rage seemed to have sobered up his pursuer and he quickly caught up with him. Naruto felt a hand roughly grab him by his neck and lift him off his feet. He kicked wildly in panic. He felt his heel connect with something soft. Uhu. The hand holding him let go. He resumed running upon touching the ground. You'll pay for this, promised his attacker. Naruto just ran. Just like the last time, he didn't get far. Soon the hands were back grabbing him and this time his captor was wary of his frantically kicking feet. So, what are we going to do first, Menma, he asked his companion who had finally regained his bearings. Hmm, started the fat man thoughtfully rubbing his chin. I say we hit him on the head, so he knows what is it like, when a stupid little demon runt jumps on yours. Don't be stupid, chided the other one. You'll just knock him out and what would be the fun of this? You're right, Kaji. We definitely cannot have that. So we just have to hit him somewhere else. Now that's what I call an idea, grinned Menma evilly. So, runt, you heard us. What say you, 
where should I hit first? Naruto didn't bother to answer. The man didn't sound interested in his opinion anyway. No suggestions? Pity. So let's just start dot here. Naruto barely registered the last word, because pain just exploded in his already bruised ribs and his breath left him in a silent scream. Why so quiet? asked Menma while Naruto was desperately forcing his lungs to start working again. I think we just have to teach this little bird to sing. He punched Naruto again. A small sigh was all that passed the boy's lips. Not good enough, commented Kaji. We'll have to continue the lesson. Two fists at once impacted on Naruto's ribcage. They robbed him of his breath just when he finally found it again. It seems this one requires a lot of tutoring. Yeah, he is pretty slow. All the while blows rained on their helpless little victim. He stopped struggling after a while, they held him securely. They eventually stopped. By the time Naruto felt like his whole body turned black and blue. So, little bird, how about singing now? asked Kaji. Naruto just hung limply in his grip. Answer, he commanded and grabbed the boy's chin forcing him to face him. Something snapped inside Naruto and he bit into his captor's palm. Hard. His mouth filled with the salty taste of blood as his elongated canines broke Kaji's skin. He bit me, said the man like he couldn't believe, what just happened. That fucking little shit just bit me. Naruto cringed. He knew that now he was really in for it. He expected another punch, but instead the man just leaned closer to him. So the little bird can peck, but singing isn't his forte. I wonder how good he is at flying. The proclamation was accompanied with such a sinister smile, that it nearly made Naruto's blood freeze. The occasional thrashings he could handle, he always recovered fast, but this went far beyond anything that had happened before. Let's try it out then, suggested Menma. They started walking leisurely towards the edge of the cliff. Naruto was panicking. He began thrashing left and right, ignoring the pain in his abused little body, hands and feet lashing in every direction, but the rough hands held him fast. In front of him the panorama of Kanahagakur no Sato was slowly revealing itself. Even now he couldn't help but admire its serene beauty. It occurred to him, that he should be more focused on trying to get away than admiring the landscape, but this was probably going to be the last time ever he could see it. No. Something inside him woke up. I won't die here. I just cannot. He had felt like that before, just never so strongly. They were already almost at the edge. Just a couple more steps and. He had no idea how, but he found the strength for one last desperate effort. He wildly swung his body forward and then backward. His feet hit. His captor fell. He took off in a mad dash. Or at least attempted to. Strong finger closing around his ankle prevented him from getting far. He fell flat on his face. He kicked madly and managed to free his feet. Some little corner of his mind that wasn't crazy with fear took notice of the fact that it was too easy. He scrambled to his feet, but the other one reached him. He just felt the fist aiming at the back of his head, even though he couldn't see it. With a speed he didn't know he possessed he half-turned and struck at his attacker. There was a strange squelching sound. Then the fat assailant toppled backwards. Naruto observed it with a sense of detached amazement. Had he really done this? The pain that had been bothering him so much just a few short moments before had somehow disappeared without him even noticing. He lifted his hand to inspect it. He didn't have much time for introspection. Kaji launched himself at him, screaming incoherently. Naruto was operating on pure instinct, but it seemed to be somebody else's one. Instead of fleeing, he stood his ground. He punched the approaching man with all his might. He wasn't even surprised, when the attacker flew back. A part of his mind pointed out that there was no way it just happened, but nobody was paying it any attention. 
The flying body reached the edge of the cliff. It seemed to have stopped, but then it started slowly sliding down. Kaji, screamed the fat man and quickly reached for his comrade's hand. Naruto's natural instincts finally took over. He turned around and flew. Behind he could hear the sounds of a man struggling to keep hold on a heavy burden followed by a high scream. He ran faster. He barely could hear the voice calling down all possible curses on his head over the sound of wind rushing past his ears. Back in council chamber, now you can surely see, just why is the monster so dangerous, Hokage-sama, finished the wizened council member. Well excuse me, but I still don't see it, answered Saratobi evenly. Uzumaki Naruto was just defending himself. But those red eyes, started the old merchant, but the Hokage cut him off. Reported only by the true culprit of the crime. Surely you aren't going to believe anything a criminal makes up to earn himself a lighter sentence or even a pardon. You are forgetting the tainted chakra, added a self-righteous voice. One of my clansmen was just nearby and felt it perfectly clearly. Is that so, Fugaku? asked Saratobi. When he was so close, why hadn't he heard the cries of a beaten child and intervened? He wasn't that close, the head of the Uchiha clan clarified. Not until the end. If you say so, replied the Hokage. What are you implying? asked Fugaku. Nothing, answered Saratobi. Should I have been implying something? Of course not. Shouldn't we return to the matter at hand, suggested Inazuka Tsum. Not everybody here has a whole day for this. She is right, agreed Akimichi Chuza. This could have been wrapped up an hour ago. Troublesome, muttered Nara Shikaku, but everybody ignored him. Yes, let's just finish it, said Satoru, one of the civilian council members, enthusiastically. So how are you going to punish the brat? As I already said, I, started Saratobi, but Satoru cut him off. You can't let him get away with it. He killed one of our people. Merely injured, corrected Saratobi. Kitahama Kaji survived his fall. Does it really count? He's been comatose since they picked him from the Nidame's head. The medics say he would never fully recover. You seem to be forgetting who is the culprit and who the injured party, pointed out the old village leader. It doesn't really matter, Fugaku made his opinion known. What matters is that the boy used its power. Today it had been only two drunkards, but who would it be tomorrow? He let his words echo through the chamber. Very true, nodded Satoru. He mustn't be allowed to think he can get away with it. That power cannot be left uncontrolled, proclaimed Danzo. We must. I know your opinion on the matter, Danzo, the Hokage cut his rival off. My answer hasn't changed. Danzo's single eyes shot him an unfriendly look. Still, we can't just let it slide, someone said. And what's worse, this might mean the seal isn't sufficiently holding the demon's power back, Hamira added his two bits. The seal was done by the greatest seal master to ever live, Saratobi reminded them. Do you doubt the Yandame's masterpiece? He was in a hurry, Koharu pointed out. It's all too easy to make mistakes under such kind of pressure. Both I and Jiraiya had examined the seal and neither of us found any weaknesses, Saratobi reassured them. But one can never be too sure, Hamura said. What can we ever be really sure about, the Hokage replied philosophically. So we have to make sure he never hurts anyone again, Satoru suggested. Sarutobi suppressed the brief urge to throttle him. We'll do no such thing, he stated. Then we will be forced to take necessary actions ourselves, since you don't seem to be willing to do what has to be done, Fugaku declared. Are you questioning my authority, the Hokage hissed dangerously. The temperature in the room seemed to have dropped several degrees. All the agitated counselors went suddenly very still. Even the Uchiha clan had squirmed uncomfortably under the aged leader's gaze. It took him a moment to gather the courage needed to speak. Forgive me, Hokage-sama, I was out of my place. 
I merely wanted to suggest the right course of action, and got carried away. He didn't sound repentant enough when he said it. It is just my duty as an advisor to help my leader make the right decision, when he is hesitant. That's it, Uchi Hassan, Saratobi spoke icily. You might give your advice, but you cannot make me accept it, if I don't deem it sound. Understood? The clan leader nodded submissively, but the fires of defiance in his eyes burned brightly. It had become quite a common occurrence lately. Saratobi frowned. This wasn't good at all. He'd have to look into it later, now he had a more pressing issue to deal with. Troublesome, the Nara clan head sighed. Before this degenerates into a fight, can I suggest a solution I'm confident everybody will find acceptable? Please speak up, Shikaku, said the Hokage. He was relieved that somebody turned the discussion away from the uncomfortable topic of Fugaku's loyalty and was curious to hear what the tactical genius had come up with. As I see it, there are two valid points. First, it was Uzumaki who was attacked and therefore can't be held responsible for merely defending himself. Second, some of the Kyubi's chakra briefly leaked through the seal. While I have total faith in the Yandame's work, I understand that not everybody can lay their worries to rest that easily. So I suggest we place Uzumaki with a guardian, who would be able to suppress the demon's power in the unlikely case it started leaking out again. That sounds all very nice, commented Satoru, but where are you going to find one? It's not like people with such power just grow on trees. In fact, there haven't been one since the death of the first Hokage. Actually, there is one, corrected Shikaku. He looked at Sarutobi asking for permission to continue. The Hokage nodded slightly. He already caught on what Shikaku was proposing and he liked it, certainly more than any of the other suggestions. You all know why Orochimaru had to flee the village, started the Nara. Some of the occupants of the room shuddered at the memory. Even after seven years the treason was still a raw wound. Do you know exactly what experiment did he conduct before being found out? The few recently instated members shook their heads. They knew the snake Sanin worked with humans, most of whom have died, but that was the extent of their knowledge. He tried to recreate the Shodai's Mokutan bloodline. He was successful. A startled gasp could be heard. Although most of his subjects have died during the procedure, one of them has survived and gained the ability. He is now a shinobi of Kanoha with a spotless record, if I'm not mistaken. I suggest we put Uzumaki into his care, he should be able to prevent any future incidents like this from occurring. For a moment, the room was silent. Isn't he too young for this sort of responsibility, asked the Karama clan head. No, he's almost all grown now and mature for his age. Would he really be able to keep the beast contained, one of the civilians on the council still wasn't convinced. The Shodai was able to keep around many great bijou as if they were nothing more than household pets, this young man would have no problem suppressing a little of overflowing chakra. The professor's confident tone seemed to have done the job. There was some more discontent muttering, but eventually everybody agreed that this was indeed the best solution. It is decided then, declared Sarutobi. Uzumaki Naruto will be placed into the care of Tenzo. ANBU headquarters at the same time the council was discussing a young boy's fate, a young man had just closed the door of his temporary room quietly, removed his cat-faced mask, kicked of his sandals and plopped himself on the bed. He didn't have the energy to undress or even go to his regular apartment. He just wanted to rest, but despite closing his eyes even sooner than his head hit the pillow, sleep eluded him. Instead his thoughts took him back to the latest mission. He had no idea where exactly did it go wrong. The moment he first noticed something wasn't as planned things were already in hell. They were surrounded and outnumbered and had to make a desperate break for it. There was no thought of trying to complete the mission, it had been an obvious setup. He would bet an S-rank pay that their target was never even there. In the end only two of them have been able to get away and Tenzo had to carry his companion for the second part of the journey back. 
he had just dumped his teammate at the hospital and went to give his report to the commander. That man's gaze made him feel like he was personally responsible for the debacle. Why did he join the ANBU anyway? The pay certainly wasn't worth it. The excitement, perhaps? No, that wasn't it either. Those cool masks? Ah, that was more like it. He loved the anonymity of it. When he donned it, nobody could recognize him. Nobody could look at him with those eyes. Nobody knew that he was a freak. Just as he was finally about to drift off to sleep, a sharp knock on the door brought him back to wakefulness. Are you there, Cat? When Tenzo confirmed, the voice continued. You are summoned by the Hokage. Yes, some days Tenzo really had no idea why he had joined ANBU at all. Hokage's office Tenzo couldn't believe his ears when he heard what the Hokage wanted him to do. Him taking care of a child? He was the freak, he was never allowed anywhere near children. He was positive he would never get into consideration for prospective Jounin Sensei. He came to understand it shortly after he had been rescued from Orochimaru's lab. And now they wanted him to take care of a four-year-old boy, no matter which one. He was good only for undertaking dangerous missions, until one day he didn't come back. The world must be coming to its end. Yet he felt oddly touched. Are you sure, Hokage-sama? He didn't even know anything about childcare. Yes, the third nodded. It is the best solution. I wonder, what the other solutions are, Tenzo thought but refrained from saying it aloud. He still didn't want to do it. But then. Didn't he wonder what he was even doing in ANBU less than an hour earlier? A change of pace would be nice. He was already getting tired of the blood. I'll do it then. Later that day Naruto was alone in his apartment. He had lived on his own ever since the orphanage had decided they didn't want anything to do with him and kicked him on the streets last year. He ha spent a week alone, hunting for scraps to eat, before the old man came and gave him this place. It wasn't anything fancy, but at least it had four walls and a roof that didn't leak too much. He was currently at the sink, rubbing his clothes with soap, trying to remove the stains of blood and grass he had acquired earlier. The public laundry wash in the next street outright refused to serve him, claiming his dirty rags would just contaminate decent people's garments. He sighed to himself. The laundry owner's attitude was quite common in the village. It made getting anything a challenge, but he was managing. His musings were cut short by a soft knock on the door. He froze. Visitors were usually bad news. But then, bad news visitors seldom knocked. He jumped down from the stool he had been standing on and went cautiously to the door. Are you there, Naruto? A voice from the other side inquired. The boy's face lit up with a smile. Old man. He opened the door. Hello, Naruto, the Hokage smiled. Hello, started the boy, but then noted another man standing behind Saratobi. He eyed the stranger warily. May we come in, the old village leader asked. Sure, Naruto nodded. The two visitors walked into what he passed as living room. So, what are you here for, he asked cautiously. Say, Naruto, how would you like to live with someone? Tenzo watched the boy instantly go on guard. Big blue eyes flickered his direction. He tried to smile reassuringly but he had no experience dealing with young children. It came out pretty lame. The boy didn't seem reassured at all. Just why did he agree to this? Must have been the sleep deprivation. Is it this man, Naruto guessed? Yes, Naruto, the Hokage confirmed. This is Tenzo. Hello, pleased to meet you, he attempted a warm greeting. Hello, the boy replied half-heartedly. The boy's eyes were still bearing into him with a cautious look. He knew such eyes. He saw them often enough. Usually in the mirror. It had been hard for him after he was freed from his torment. People kept watching him warily. 
what was he after whatever the traitor had done to him? Can he be trusted? Won't he just turn on us when we drop our guard? He wanted to reach to the friends he used to have before his ordeal, but they have grown distant. Even they couldn't stand to get close to him anymore. It had hurt. In a way, it hurt even more than Orochimaru's procedures. And the pain never quite went away. For a while, he tried to connect with a fellow survivor of the snake Sanin's treachery, but it didn't work. She was just too different from him. So he had been mostly alone ever since. Yet now, when he looked into the little boy's eyes, he felt like he just found a kindred spirit. So maybe this wasn't such a bad idea after all. For Naruto's part, he didn't trust the stranger he was told would become his new guardian. When he had lived in the orphanage, many people came through and took out other kids becoming their guardians or even legal parents. But they never even considered him. Only one did. Naruto tried not to think about that time. He was actually happy to land back in the orphanage two months later. So he wasn't thrilled to go with this stranger. But then Tenzo smiled and it had been a real, kind smile. Naruto rarely saw such aimed his way. He smiled back. He dared to hope that things were actually starting to look up. As soon as Tenzo finished his mission report, he headed home. He found it hard to combine his ANBU career with raising a kid, but he wasn't complaining. It took some time for them to adjust to the sudden change of their lifestyles, but it was worth it. He now couldn't even imagine coming back to an empty apartment. Speaking of which, there was nobody inside now. He quickly checked the rooms and found Naruto's training pouch missing. He calmed down, changed from the black ops uniform into a customary jounin garb and headed to the nearest training ground. Sure enough, there was his charge hurling practice shuriken at a wooden post. Your grip is a bit off, he commented after observing the boy's efforts for a while. Naruto whirled towards him. A huge grin spread on his face. Tenzo-san. You're back, he exclaimed happily. Was there any doubt, he asked with a smile. Naruto's face was answer enough. Despite his young age, the boy possessed a surprisingly good grasp of the perils of a ninja's profession. It brought home the reality of just what his life had been before they met. Tenzo certainly hadn't been like that at his age. He quickly showed the thoughts aside, before they could sour his mood. You have to hold it like this, he said and demonstrated Naruto the correct way. The little blonde immediately adjusted his grip. Still not quite, commented Tenzo and pointed out the mistake. Now that's better. Throw it. The child did so. The projectile embedded itself near the center of the target. You see the difference? It was a better hit than the previous attempts. And they weren't bad either, especially considering how recently he had started practicing. There was some serious potential there. He let Naruto exercise some more, until he was satisfied with his progress. Enough of this for now, he declared. The boy looked at him dejectedly. Let's do some taijutsu practice instead. Blue eyes immediately lit up. Their owner enthusiastically slipped into a basic stance. Tenzo grinned and crouched down to engage him. They haven't studied anything fancy yet, just the basic stances, blocks and dodges. The boy had caught to it like fish to water. The young ANBU had been surprised how quick his reflexes were. He doubted many kids his age could boast better ones. The boy was still too young to be admitted in the academy, but Tenzo considered sending him there anyway. He had both determination and stamina in spades and he had no doubt that Naruto would do well. And making some friends close to his age wouldn't hurt as well. But there were also other things to consider. His mood darkened when he remembered what had occurred just a day after he took the little foxy boy in. A month earlier it was easy for them to decide where they would be living from now on. Tenzo's apartment was bigger and had no leaks. When it had come to packing Naruto's possessions, he was horrified. 
Most of his clothes were either too big or too small and even the rest weren't fit. To be worn by a four-year-old boy. We're going shopping tomorrow, he decided. His young charge looked at him in askance. But I have no money, he pointed out. That doesn't matter since I do, the man replied. I don't want to be a bother. You could use the money better. Nonsense, Tenzo dismissed his worry. There is nothing better to spend money on than making little kids happy. Besides I'm receiving pay to make sure I can take proper care of you. Really? Naruto asked dubiously. Really, Tenzo confirmed. It was the truth. Because taking care of a child required him to take less missions in ANBU, he had been given a financial compensation. The next day they set out to the business district. Tenzo was walking in the front, Naruto keeping at his heels. They were both doing their best to ignore the cold stares the people were shooting them. Tenzo noticed that they were a lot colder than usual. They entered a clothes shop. The shopkeeper greeted them with a professional smile plastered on his face, but it had quickly morphed into a scowl, when he noticed Naruto. What is he doing in here? The child hid behind his guardian's legs and tried to become invisible. He came to buy some clothes, obviously. This is a clothes shop, isn't it? Tenzo asked while looking over the numerous outfits displayed around. How dare you just bring him here, the owner hissed. And just why shouldn't I, Tenzo replied evenly. Because. You know. Well excuse me, but I don't. Would you please care to enlighten me, he asked too sweetly. Because he. The shopkeeper bit his tongue before he could blurt out something unwise. He hesitated for a moment before deciding on an acceptable answer that won't land him in trouble. Because of what he did yesterday. And just what would be that, the Mokutan user raised an eyebrow. I am unaware of any misconduct on his part. He threw a man of the Hokage monument. Just how is that nothing? The merchant exploded. He was merely defending himself from an unprovoked assault, Tenzo corrected him. He started throwing stones first, the shopkeeper insisted. You must be misinformed. The report I have read of that incident doesn't speak of such thing. By this time, the man was sweating under Tenzo's gaze. Stupid report then, the guy barked. Or stupid people. This man's mental capacities are clearly lacking, he said turning to the boy, who was still cowering behind his legs. We are going, Naruto. After I had a good look at the shopkeeper, I don't even want to know what his merchandise is like. And with those words they left the establishment. That didn't go too well, he remarked once they were back on the street. Naruto remained silent. Let's go elsewhere but their luck didn't turn for the better. They had yet to encounter a clerk who wouldn't glare at them. They didn't quite dare to throw them out, but they tried to overprice them or sell them inferior goods. But they managed to get most of what they needed. Only shoes remained uncrossed on their shopping list. They wandered into the proper store. The saleswoman barely noticed them, being too busy chatting with a customer. Not that they minded. They were glad they could try on the footwear without being disturbed. As Tenzo carried Naruto's selection of shoes to the counter, he paused when he heard the conversation between the clerk and the customer. He strained his ears and listened in. Poor little Akai's was so distraught he couldn't hit a single target. It was a wonder he was even able to come to the academy after what the monster did to his father. I rather gave him the day off to visit him at the hospital. Yes, dear, the shopkeeper nodded empathically. It is terrible that the monster is allowed to roam free. And what's more, the academy instructor continued, I heard that they let him get away with it. I swear if that demon ever tries to attend the academy I am going to make sure he never finishes. She said it in such a forceful tone that it left little doubt just what was she going to do to accomplish it. Quite right, the saleswoman encouraged. If he can cause that much damage now, who can tell what he would be able to do if he ever gets training? 
You're not the only one who feels that way, the teacher agreed. Tenzo had enough listening. He laid his purchase on the counter and paid. Then he grabbed the distraught boy and dragged him out of the shop. The clerk and the instructor had resumed their chit-chat. They never noticed just who had been there. The pair walked home in silence. Only after the doors of their apartment closed behind them did Naruto speak. They are going to hurt me, he stated in a small voice. No, they aren't, Tenzo reassured him. I won't allow it. You can't be with me all the time, Naruto pointed out. Not at the academy. So you want to be a ninja? The ANBU wasn't surprised. Yes, the boy confirmed. The best ninja ever. My, my, aren't we ambitious, Tenzo smiled despite himself at the sight of the child's serene face. But I can't do that if I can't finish the academy, Naruto's face fell. Don't worry about it now, his guardian consoled him. You still have a couple of years before you'll start. Do I really have to wait so long? inquired the blonde. I'm afraid so, the older man replied. Why are you in such a rush anyway? So I'll get strong soon and the angry men couldn't beat me anymore, the kid explained. I suppose you have a point there, the adult agreed. Okay then, I'll start teaching you tomorrow. Yay! Naruto punched the air. Why not today? Why, indeed, Tenzo asked himself. You know what, let's get you dressed and we'll head to the training grounds. Back at the training grounds Tenzo hadn't thought it would accomplish much, but he had shown his student the barest basics anyway. And had been amazed at how quickly he had taken to them. Ever since that day they would come to the training grounds and work on Naruto's skills. And when he decided that his charge had enough, since the boy seemed utterly incapable of telling it himself, they went home and worked on Naruto's academic knowledge. Those lessons were received with much less enthusiasm than the practical ones, but he had been somehow able to partially convince Naruto of their importance nevertheless. Mainly when he pointed out that he couldn't be a ninja if he couldn't read his mission assignment. Okay, Naruto, that's enough for today, he decided. So soon, the boy protested. We barely started. We've been at it for an hour, the man pointed out. That's nothing, the blonde claimed. You have been here on your own for who knows how long and I have just returned from a mission. I think it's safe to say that we both need our rests. The guardian didn't relent. The big strong tough guy outlasted by a kid, who would have thought, a female voice interrupted. He slowly turned towards its source. And why did you decide to grace us with your presence today, Anko? There was a dark-haired woman dressed in a tan trench coat standing on a tree trunk perpendicularly to the ground. Naruto was staring at her perplexed. I came here to train, the newcomer answered. Last time I checked it was still a public training ground. What is the lady doing? Naruto asked perplexed. Trying to make a conversation, what does it look like, squirt, Anko replied with a strange smile. The child scowled. It was cute. Then she turned to Tenzo. So, I've heard you've gotten yourself a runt, is that him? The man nodded. She jumped off the tree with a somersault and landed in front of the startled boy. She crouched down and looked into his eyes. Naruto tried to look undaunted, but failed. At least he resisted the urge to make a step back. So what do we have here, the woman started. He could now see that she was very young, still more a girl rather than an adult. He also noted that she was wearing something that barely passed as clothes underneath her coat. When she noticed where his eyes roamed, she laughed mischievously. Do you like them? W what? Naruto stammered. Lost your speech? I'm glad I haven't lost my touch, she teased. Did you come here to corrupt innocent young minds, Anko, Tenzo chided her. She smirked. You know me. Yes, I do, he sighed exasperatedly. Why did I ever ask? If that's all, we'll be going. Why do you think it's all? 
she grinned. We're going anyway, declared Tenzo, lifted Naruto on his shoulders and turned to leave. You can now train in peace. He didn't wait for her answer and quickly took off. Who was that lady? Naruto asked. She's an old acquaintance, his guardian answered. What was she doing, his charge inquired. She was messing with your mind, the ANBU explained. She is quite good at that. That's not what I meant. How was she standing on the tree, the boy clarified. It's called tree walking. It's one of the basic skills of ninja, Tenzo replied. When will you teach me? Naruto asked eagerly. You still have time. You haven't started drawing on your chakra yet. And how can I do that? The curious child refused to drop the matter. I'll show you later, the adult tried to brush it off. But I want to know now. Tenzo sighed in exasperation. For your old boys sure were bothersome. Why did he ever think this was a good idea? You're acting like a spoiled brat, he rebuked Naruto. Have patience, I'll show you everything in good time. That silenced Naruto for a while. But Tenzo had no doubt that he would have to teach the little brat about chakra soon. A month later, enough for today, Tenzo decided. Already? Naruto asked dejectedly. They had been practicing drawing on one's chakra and the older man was amazed at how much Naruto had. Perhaps he shouldn't be, all things considered. The blonde stamina had to be supported by something. Even though he was dripping with sweat, he still refused to admit that he had enough. Yes. Look at the time. We should go get dinner. That made the boy smile a bit. Food was something Naruto never turned down. He had to somehow reclaim all the energy he burned off during the daily trainings. He could wolf down anything that was put in front of him on a platter. It never ceased to amaze the young ANBU how such a huge mound of rations can fit into such a small body. He just chalked it up as another one of the many peculiarities his little ball of sunshine had. They didn't have a favorite place to eat so they usually just wandered through the town and looked for a place that didn't refuse to serve demons. They were strolling down a street when the most appetizing scent caught Naruto's nose. He sniffed the air like a dog or fox. He looked around to determine where it had come from. He didn't have to search long. His senses soon pointed to a stall just a hundred steps ahead. He immediately made a beeline for it. Tenzo actually had to quicken his pace to keep up. The foxy boy climbed on one of the high stools next to the counter, his caretaker took place beside him and discreetly scanned their surroundings. There was only one other person in the establishment, but he didn't spare them a single look. Good. It seemed like they could eat here in peace. Welcome to Ichiraku's ramen, greeted them the middle-aged chef. What will you be having? Naruto was studying the menu, but he wasn't having much success. His reading lessons were coming along well, but there were still too many words he didn't understand. He scrunched his forehead in concentration. He debated with himself, whether he should just point a random food and hope it was edible, but then decided against it. Whatever smells so good, he ordered. All our cooking smells good, the stall owner replied with a smile. You'll have to pick one, added a young girl behind the counter, obviously the elder man's daughter. This one, then. Naruto pointed at a random selection. The chef disappeared in the kitchenette. Soon after he reappeared with a steaming bowl in his hands. Here you are, mister. Naruto picked up his chopsticks and dug in. He entered Nirvana. The taste was so good, caressing his taste buds like heavenly ambrosia. This was sure the food of gods. Suddenly the bowl was empty. Naruto glared at it in dismay. Can I have more? he asked. Of course, the chef answered with a chuckle. Right here. Everybody was amazed at how much the small child was able to put away. Tenzo realized that he'll probably have to reassess his food budget. Feeding Naruto proved to be quite costly. 
but seeing the happiness shining in the little blonde's face he couldn't find it in himself to deny him. It seemed like they just found their restaurant of choice. Another month later Naruto and Tenzo were going through one of their first spars. I wasn't much of a fight yet, but the boy was enjoying himself immensely. Even Tenzo was sporting a smile on his face. They were interrupted by an amused chuckle. They turned to the person which had been observing them from the shade of the trees without them noticing. Old man. Hokage-sama, they exclaimed at the same time. Is something the matter, the ANBU asked. Not at all, the wizened village leader replied. I just wanted to see how are you doing. Great, Naruto answered happily. Tenzo is teaching me wonderful things. Do you want to see? Not now. I just wanted to make sure everything was all right, Saratobi said. It is, the boy assured him. Thanks for letting me live with Tenzo. You're the greatest. The elderly man chuckled at the child's praise. I want to be just like you when I grow up. Really, the elderly man smiled. That's nice. Yes, old man. I'll be Hokage like you, just you watch, Naruto declared. Aren't you aiming high, Sarutobi commented. That is no small feat, but I'll make it. Believe it, Naruto stated with unwavering determination. Forgive me, Hokage-sama, where are my manners, Tenzo said and made a bench grow from the ground. Naruto stared open-mouthed. He had never seen his guardian use his special power before. Thank you very much. But I'm afraid I have to decline your invitation. I still have some appointments today. I have to leave now. He disappeared in a shunshin. Wow, the boy exclaimed admiring Tenzo's creation. Can you make other things grow? Can you grow a house? The Mokutan user smiled at his young charge's excitement. Why, yes. Then why don't you live in one? the blonde wondered. And just where would I put it? Tenzo threw his arms around in a dramatic gesture. Right here, the boy answered like it was the simplest thing in the world. I'm afraid that's not possible, the grown man shook his head. It is a public training ground. And somewhere else, the young demon vessel tried. Like where? His caretaker raised an eyebrow. Anywhere? And what about? Something smaller than a house? Like a tree house? The puppy eyes were irresistible. Okay, the man agreed. I'll make you a tree house. Five years old Bunshin no Jutsu. Ah. Naruto was getting frustrated. No matter how hard he tried, the clone wouldn't form right. He got down the henge in no time, discovering he could make the change physical instead of mere illusion and Kawarimi after a bit of struggle, but not this. Tenzo originally blamed it on bad chakra control and taught him tree walking to remedy it, but it was of little help. He now knew the leaf floating, water walking and point balancing exercises and was pretty sure he was the only one in his age group who could boast such ability, but the basic clone jutsu still eluded him for reasons unknown. He kicked the pale sickly apparition sprawled on the ground, causing it to dispel. What am I doing wrong? If he were the type to pull out his hair in frustration, he would have been already bald. Maybe it's just not your type of technique, a silky voice suggested. Enko, he turned around startled. The kunoichi jumped down from a tree. She took on a habit of appearing occasionally during their trainings, offering a witty comment or two. Tenzo was always exasperated by her visits, but Naruto came to enjoy them. She was fun. Every shinobi have a technique they just can't get right no matter what they do, the woman continued. Are you saying I should just give up? Naruto asked offended. I'll do it, believe it. I'm not saying that, just that maybe you should try something a bit different instead, the snake summoner clarified. Like what? The boy was intrigued. I'll show you, but you must promise me you won't tell a soul who showed it to you. The mischievous expression on her face would send grown men running, but not Naruto. He was hooked on her words. 
Why? he asked a bit puzzled, a bit excited. Is it forbidden? No, merely restricted, she explained. It has a high chakra cost, but that shouldn't be a problem to you. Okay, I'm game. Bring it on. The child agreed eagerly. You asked for it, brat, the kunoichi smiled. Here comes the shadow clone jutsu. Six years old it was one of their rare days off. Tenzo convinced Naruto to forego training for today and instead they were spending their time wandering through the park, enjoying the sunshine, eating ice cream and ignoring the stares of the villagers. They had a lot of practice with it. You, an angry voice sounded. They paid it no heed. I'm talking to you, damn it. Pay attention. They didn't acknowledge him until he stood in front of them effectively blocking their way. They tried to bypass him, but he stubbornly refused to let them. The sight of a ten or maybe eleven years old kid trying to bully a grown-up shinobi was comical. A group of his friends was observing the scene with curiosity. Do you want something? Tenzo asked calmly. Yes. How does he dare to show his face in public, he ranted. Self-righteously. He should rot at jail for what he did to my father. Should I know you? Naruto inquired. No, but you know him, the as of yet unknown boy pointed to his right. Naruto followed his finger and his eyes landed on a man in a wheelchair. His breath caught in his throat. He recognized the hateful face. He shrunk back, hiding behind Tenzo's legs. He hadn't acted like that in over a year, but his guardian couldn't fault him. He recognized the person as well. Kitahama Kaji, he stated. So you are minding the brat now, the crippled man said. So I am, the shinobi confirmed. Kaji looked like he wanted to say something, but the ANBU's face and too many onlookers made him rethink it. Go away, he growled. Just go away. We'll go. Tenzo decided. Come, Naruto. They turned around to leave. Don't you just walk away, Kaji's son shouted. Quiet, Akai's, his father chastised him. Hey, the boy yelled. Some instinct warned Naruto about the danger, but he was too slow to move. Tenzo was already moving, but he misjudged the situation. The kunai struck Naruto in the back. He fell forward. Akai stared like he couldn't quite comprehend what he just did. He wasn't the only one. A stunned silence reigned over the park until Tenzo called for military police to arrest the culprit. Then he knelt down by the wounded boy. Naruto was in pain. He had been injured before, but never stabbed so deep. He felt the blood pouring from his wound. He also felt a familiar heat spreading through his body. A barely perceptible whisper sounded in his mind. He couldn't understand the words, but he knew what it wanted him to do. He lifted himself to his knees and pulled out the weapon. Blood flowed freely for a moment, then stopped. Naruto, his guardian, shouted in alarm. He ignored him. He started toward the attacker, who by now was trembling in fear. Then trees suddenly burst from the ground, stopping him, binding him. The burning from his veins disappeared. The wound on his back made itself no via an attack of pain. He blinked in surprise. What had just happened? Then strong arms wrapped around him. The trees released him. Let's go, his caretaker said. He just nodded. He was too tired to do anything else. The evening Sarutobi knocked at Tenzo's door. His head was still pounding from the shouting match he had to sit through in today's council session. The bunch of reprobates had heard about the incident in the park almost as soon as it had happened and naturally demanded something had to be done about the demon. Even when he pointed out that Naruto hadn't actually done anything, they were unrelenting. He sighed. He really wasn't looking forward to announcing to the poor boy what they made him agree to. The door opened and he stepped in. How do you feel? he asked after the greetings. Well, the young demon vessel answered. 
it doesn't even hurt anymore. I'm glad to hear it, the Hokage smiled. But that isn't what you came. For, the boy guessed. You are right. Am I that obvious? Naruto didn't deign it with an answer. It's something bad, isn't it, the blonde stated. Right on target again, the village leader confirmed. They banned you from entering the academy. What? Naruto looked at him with a dejected look in his wide blue eyes. They can stop me from becoming a ninja? No, they can't do that, Sarutobi shook his head. They merely won't allow you to study at the academy. You can still become a shinobi if you pass the test. So I just have to study with Tenzo, the boy asked with hope. Yes, the old man confirmed. That's it. That's great, Naruto smiled relieved. I can still take your hat. Train hard and we'll see, Sarutobi smiled back. Old man, I have to ask you something, the youth changed the topic, his voice suddenly solemn. What is it? The Hokage went on guard. What happened today? That was just the question he feared. What do you mean, Naruto? You were there. He tried to dodge it, but no such luck. Don't try to change the matter again, old man, the boy said angrily. It won't work on me anymore. I just have to know what was that heat, why did my wound heal so quickly and what did Tenzo do? And don't tell me I'm not ready to know. I already have a theory about it and the truth cannot possibly be much worse. So please come clean and tell me about the Kyubi. The Hokage was shocked, although perhaps he shouldn't be. Naruto was quite clever, after all. At least when no books were involved. Very well then. Sit down, it is a long story. Seven years old Naruto stood in the middle of the training field, a wooden stick in his hands and waved it around in a complicated dance. A group of shadow clones was mirroring his movements. When his guardian had first found out about them, he had been furious at Anko, but he had to admit their usefulness. That naturally didn't mean he forgave the crazy Kunoichi. What are you doing? Tenzo asked. Practicing my kenjutsu, the boy answered. He was fascinated with the art of the sword ever since he saw Tenzo in a sparring match against an ANBU woman. But you never trained it before, the older man pointed out. Then I should better start, shouldn't I, the ninja wannabe stated simply. You don't have a sword, his sensei reminded him. Then I'll have to get one, the boy had a simple solution. You mean it, don't you, Tenzo smiled. Naruto nodded. Very well. I'll show you the correct way, Tenzo agreed. And if you are any good, I'll see about getting you a sword. A chop, a jab, a block, a step back then two to the right, spin, charge, retreat and then attack again. Hear the air swish as the blade cuts through it. Jump high, land in a crouch and stab backwards at an imaginary opponent. She finished the kata and sheathed her sword. She smiled. Everything was perfect. She went through the whole exercise without the smallest twitch, with no sign of hesitation and only the slightest hint of the obnoxious pain. Finally, after all the time, her injuries were fully healed. She still shuddered when she remembered them. She could even now feel the phantom pain of a kunai sliding across her ribs, her attempt to block the strike, then the punch that had shattered her arm. The hit to her head she didn't feel until after she woke up in the hospital two days later. The medics hadn't been sure she would be ever able to resume her shinobi career. She recalled the time of despair, worsened even when she had heard the results of the exams. Oh, how she had been proud to make it to the finals. Now she just wanted to kick herself for the stupidity. She hadn't been ready. She might have done well on the first test, but the second one she had passed only thanks to her teammates. In the third part she had lost her first match almost as soon as it begun. She had to realize with shame that she was out of her depth. And to add insult to injury, both of her teammates had advanced in rank. She didn't. It took some painful introspection, 
but she realized she hadn't been taking her training seriously enough. She had always prided herself on not being a useless fangirl like so many young Kunoichi, but it turned out that wasn't enough. Well, no more. She would now put everything she's got into her training. She'd train and train and then train some more until she'd become the best and even then she wouldn't stop training. Now only the matter of her team waited on her mind. Since her teammates had both made Chunin and her recovery had been uncertain, they took off on their different carriers and her squad had been officially disbanded. So now she was a wee little Jenin without a team and she wouldn't be able to go on missions and enter the Chunin exams again until she got onto a new one. She'll have to be good so the senseis would fight over her, otherwise she'll stay in the reserves forever. With that resolve she resumed her training. Elsewhere the young girl was running through the forest at top speed, her three grey dogs, still puppies, at her heels. She strained both her nose and ears to discern what was happening ahead. This was supposed to be an easy bodyguard mission, but it had suddenly become apparent that it exceeded the parameters of a C-rank. It had started innocently enough. They were escorting the rich businessman's daughter and her two servants on a trip to visit her aunt in Port City. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, the flowers were blooming and the only inconvenience they had encountered so far was the cloud of dust behind the ox-driven cart carrying their client's possessions. A mission as easy as pie, one would say. But their sensei insisted on taking it seriously anyway. That's why she found herself as the forward scout. It was a logical choice, because she and her canines were able to smell trouble from miles ahead. And they haven't noticed a thing out of the ordinary. That's why they were so startled when they heard a scream from behind. She turned on her heels and took the air into her nose. Nothing. The wind wasn't blowing today. She channeled chakra to her ears. She picked a crack of broken wood followed by ringing of steel meeting steel. Definitely a battle. She took to the treetops and sped towards their small entourage. The battle seemed to have reached a peak and was slowly dying down. She pumped even more chakra into her legs and willed herself to go faster. Soon she arrived at the scene. While she had been scouting ahead, they had been attacked from behind. She saw her sensei defending against two opponents. He was already sporting a gash on his cheek and his left thigh was leaking red. She didn't stop to think, her instincts took over. She jumped from the tree with a battle cry and lunged at the closest opponent. He dodged. She landed on all fours. For a moment, her back was exposed to him. He tried to stab her, but a gray blur jumped him. He barely avoided the snapping jaws. But then a mouth full of sharp teeth closed around his calf. He looked down in surprise. He hadn't realized that there might be more than one dog. That hesitation cost him dearly. The third canine hit his hip and took out a bit of skin. The man screamed. By the time the girl was back on her feet and joined the fray. A quick application of her clan's secret jutsu gave her feral qualities. With her nails turned into claws she swiped at the man. She now had a better view of him. He was wearing standard shinobi clothes, dark jumpsuit with a flak jacket of a design she couldn't immediately recognize. He was wearing a hitaiate on his forehead, but his dirty hair obscured the symbol. He blocked her attack with ease. So the little girl came to play, he sneered. More fun for me. He kicked away the dog biting into his leg. She saw that momentary loss of balance and attacked. He managed to avoid her blow, but one of her dogs got hold of his side. Unfortunately his teeth couldn't penetrate the armored vest. The man batted him away with a fist. Pathetic, he commented. Is that all you got? She scowled. Of course that wasn't all. It was time to take out the big guns. She reached into her pouch and took out three tiny orbs. Take that, boys, she shouted throwing the soldier pills to her canine partners. They caught them from the air and promptly swallowed. Their fur stood on its end and darkened. 
they seem to grow bigger. I'll show you just what I've got, hissed the Kunoichi. Gatsuga. She jumped in the air and started spinning, her companions following suit. Soon four small tornado-like projectiles were flying at the attacker from different directions. His eyes widened in surprise, but he was too experienced ninja to be caught off guard that easily. He frantically dodged, but the attacks changed their direction and still followed him. But he was fast. He saw an opening between them and took it. He was able to avoid most of the attack, but... One still glanced his thigh. He grimaced in pain when his leg had trouble supporting him. You'll pay for this, little shit, he promised. The girl paid him no mind. She and her dogs were readying themselves for another charge. The man's face suddenly registered surprise and then he toppled forward, revealing the form of the girl sensei with a bloodied kunai in his hand. That was reckless, Hannah, he chided. The young Kunoichi now registered the form of the other attacker lying still on the ground, his throat slit. I know, sensei, she admitted. She then looked around. Where is everyone? Her sensei pointed behind the cart. She quickly took off. And halted after just a few steps. There were lying her teammates, the ground red with their blood. The maid and the cart driver were sprawled beside them. She couldn't move, she couldn't speak, she could barely breathe. Then she registered a small sound. She awoke from her stupor. One of them was still alive. She knelt down to the wounded boy and quickly examined him. She was no expert, but she had some basic medical knowledge. Her aunt had been tutoring her in the ways of a veterinarian, but she found little interest in it. The paths of warriors or trackers were more alluring to her. But now she swore that she wouldn't try to skip on her lessons ever again. Because what she was able to discern wasn't comforting at all. The boy's lung had been punctured and an artery was ruptured. He was slowly drowning in his own blood. She quickly ran through her meager arsenal of medical techniques and came up with a blood-stopping jutsu. She hadn't fully mastered it yet, but it would have to do. She forced her shaky fingers into the necessary hand seals and was relieved when her hand was enveloped in the familiar green glow. She laid her palm on the wound. She prayed it would work. The bleeding slowly lessened and then stopped. Hannah let out a breath and deactivated the jutsu. It seemed her teammate would live for the while. She registered soft steps behind her. She whirled to face the newcomer her arms automatically assuming the fighting stance even though her dogs were calm. It was just her sensei. The man was leaning on the cart, his right hand clutching at his bleeding thigh. Sensei, she cried out half relieved, half alarmed. How are they, he asked. Jubi lives, she answered. And Takita? She walked over her other fallen teammate. She ran a quick diagnostic jutsu over him and then hung her head in defeat. Tears spilled from her eyes. I'm sorry, her sensei said slowly, but now isn't time for grieving. She wiped her eyes and stood up. She didn't know what she should do now. Now the excitement of the battle turned down, the reality of what had happened dawned on her. We cannot linger here, sensei pointed out. The last one may return any time when his comrades won't catch up to him. Another one? she asked alarmed. Yes, the one who took away our client and took down Jubii and... Takita. What are we going to do? she asked, suddenly feeling very young and helpless. A part of her mind told her to go after the last enemy to complete their mission and avenge her friends, but another didn't want to leave them. And yet another one told her that it didn't matter anyway, since she couldn't defeat the enemy and would wind up dead no matter what she would do. We'll have to salvage what we can, the Jounin decided. I'm currently in no shape to fight and you are no match for such an opponent. Is Jubii stable now? I think so, I did what I could. Good. Then patch me up the best you can. We must be prepared when the last one shows up. Yes, sensei. She started to work. 
Who were they? she inquired after a while. According to their scratched headbands they were nuke neen. But they didn't seem like your typical bunch. Their gear was in too good shape. They might have been just pretending so they wouldn't implicate their village. So there might be others, she asked fearfully. I hope not. Otherwise we're dead. It's finished, Sensei, Hannah said. Can you stand on your own? The man tried it. Yes, thank you. This'll do. He limped towards his other surviving student. How bad off is he? She ran a diagnosis and grimaced. Very bad. I managed to stop his bleeding, but his lung is still collapsed. I'm afraid it would take a much better medic than me to heal him. I don't think he'll survive long enough to get him back to Kanoha. We'll have to try anyway. Let's get him on the cart. We'll be riding home. The only good thing about this situation is that we still have the oxen. They carefully lifted the wounded boy. He let out a pained cry that quickly turned into a gurgle. Hannah winced. They laid him into the cart. She made sure his wound hadn't opened. At least something went well today. What about the others? she asked. The cart is big enough. We can take them to Kanoha to their families. They loaded the bodies. Sensei then took the reins and turned the cart around. They began their journey back to Kanoha. She was exhausted after the battle and healing, but she didn't allow herself to rest. She kept looking over her shoulder, expecting an attack any time. Calm down, Hannah. I don't think we'll be attacked that soon. Why? Our client was taken captive, not killed. That means he has to deliver her somewhere. It seems like the mission is more important to him than his comrades. She shuddered. Something like that was unforgivable in her clan. But she decided to trust the words of her sensei and rest on the cart for a while. Besides there were still her trusty dogs keeping guard on them. The journey seemed much longer than when they had traveled in the opposite direction. Hannah kept watch over Jubiai. She fed him a blood-replenishing pill, but it only caused his wound to reopen. She managed to close it again, but he probably lost most of the blood he had regained due to the medicine. It was all she could do to restrain herself from pulling out her hair in frustration. The boy's condition was steadily worsening. His skin became ashen, his breathing too fast and shallow. He won't live to see the evening, she was positive of it. And there wasn't a single thing she could do about it. She hated the feeling of helplessness. And Kanoha was still too far. She watched the sun slowly descending to the horizon. The shadows were lengthening and she half expected an enemy hiding in every one of them. Sometime during the afternoon Jubiai stopped breathing. She wanted to cry for him, but instead she just felt numb. There was panic ebbing at the edges of her mind, but she refused to acknowledge it. She knew that if she allowed herself any stronger emotions, she would just break down. Evening came and they stopped for the night. Her sensei took the first watch. She lay in her sleeping bag, but sleep eluded her. Instead the events of the previous day kept replaying themselves in front of her eyes. Then it was suddenly morning. Had she dozed off? They packed up the camp and sat on the road. She just stared blankly forward. When they were attacked, she didn't even notice it. It took one of her dogs tackling her to the ground to wake her from her stupor. She quickly scanned her surroundings. Then dodged as a kunai sailed towards her head. She located where it had come from. She sprung to her feet, her own kunai in hand. Her sensei had already thrown a couple of shuriken into the foliage. Their assailant swiftly moved out of the way. Then a hail of sunbon flew from the opposite direction. She barely evaded them. There were two enemies, hhh they were screwed. One of the attackers came out of the bushes and her sensei engaged him. She scanned the trees for the other one. She heard a kunai whistling in the air, but it wasn't aimed at her. She looked over her shoulder. 
Her sensei just barely dodged the thrown blade, but it put too much strain on his injured leg. He stumbled and hissed in pain. His opponent capitalized on it. He stabbed at his chest. Sensei managed to block it, but the knife went right through his forearm. She screamed and rushed to his aid. The other one attacked before she could reach him. She managed to get into a stance and block his strike, but it felt like her bones were breaking. Her dogs immediately jumped the nuke neen and forced him to retreat momentarily. But then he pulled out a katana and they had to back off to avoid being cut to pieces. Hannah briefly considered her options and took four pills from her pouch. She threw three of them to her partners and swallowed one herself. She leapt away to avoid a vicious sword strike, then activated her quadruped technique. Let's go, boys, she shouted. Gatsuga. For furry tornadoes started after the man. He managed to avoid them entirely. Again, commanded Hannah. This time her opponent didn't run. He ran through some hand seals and slammed his fist to the ground. A wall of earth rose from the ground. The four attacking whirlwinds slammed into it painfully. Small cracks appeared in the barrier, but it held. The foursome fell to the ground. How did you like that, stupid pups? The man laughed. Hannah's head hurt too much to glare at him. Wimpy little puppies shouldn't play with big bad wolves. She shook her head to clear it. She lifted herself on her hands and knees. The man kicked her side knocking her back down. One of her dogs charged at him, but he punched his muzzle sending him flying. The others finally got to their paws and started at him. He simply grabbed his katana again and easily held them off. One of her trusted friends now sported a long gash along his backside. It looked bad for them. She somehow got to her feet before the man attacked again. She blocked his blade with a kunai, but she was pushed back nevertheless. The next strike didn't chop off her head only because one of her dogs tackled him. It earned him a punch that broke his ribs. Now I had it. The man snapped. I'll kill the mutts first and then I take my time with you, girl. Then he was forced to dodge a hail of kunai. What the, he started. Two figures jumped from the trees, weapons drawn, and charged at him. Two more went after the other missing Neen. She recognized their armor and masks. An ANBU patrol. They were saved. The battle took a swift end after that, the outlaws being no match for a superior number of elite warriors. She watched it with indifferent eyes. Are you all right, Kunoichi-san, one of the masked men asked. She nodded mechanically. Can you tell us what happened? She started retelling the events of the last two days. The ANBU had some more questions and she answered obediently. When they said they would be escorting them to Kanoha, she wavered on her feet. The one with bare mask had to support her. The exhaustion finally caught up with her. They had to carry her all the way home. Hokage's office Sarutobi sighed tiredly when he finished reading the detailed report. It was quite a debacle for a simple C-rank mission, but clients sometimes tended to downplay the amount and wealth of their enemies to save on the mission cost. Rich merchants were the worst. The competition was vicious and they sought to cut their expenses whenever they could. And then they had the gall to play the injured party when disasters like this happened. The elderly Hokage wished he could just have every such idiot assassinated, but then Kanoha would soon run out of clients. Usually the only thing he could do when a mission increased in difficulty was to charge higher prices, but self-important cheap-ass morons who got his ninja killed would regret it dearly. He had already sent a team to find the missing girl and whoever paid that nuke neen, if they indeed were such. Nobody got away with killing Shinobi of Kanoha. Specialists were currently busy with the bodies, trying to discern where did they come from. He tried to tell himself that it could have been worse. Still, two fresh genin dead and a jounin crippled was a pretty bad outcome, no matter how he looked at it. He forced his thoughts to turn to more positive matters, like what to do with the surviving girl. 
he picked the files of current Genin and started to study them. Later Tenzo fully expected to be sent on a mission when he was suddenly summoned to the Hokage's office, so he took his battle gear. He was therefore surprised when the aged village leader motioned for him to come closer. He looked at his superior in askance, waiting for him to speak. Tell me, Tenzo, is Naruto ready for field duty? Training grounds Tenzo arrived at the meeting point with time to spare. He used it to reminiscence on the recent events. When the Hokage had asked him whether Naruto was ready, he had panicked for a moment. What did Sarutobi want with his little boy? But he had to truthfully admit that his young student was now safely on Genin level. Then the professor told him he wanted to put him on a team and make Tenzo their sensei. Saying he was surprised would be an understatement. He had never thought he would be in charge of his own Genin squad, but then four years ago he wouldn't have believed he would end up raising a child. Well, life was full of surprises and this one wasn't entirely unwelcome. Though he might want to wait with the final verdict until he met his team in person. Graveyard Hana stood silently in front of a new tombstone. It had been only three days since she had been released from the hospital and two since her teammate's funeral. Their sensei couldn't attend, he was still bedridden. She had been shocked when she had heard that he would never regain full use of his arm again. She knew it meant the end of his ninja career. She knew she was being illogical, but she couldn't shake the feeling that it was partially her fault. If she could detect the enemy sooner, if she were with her team when the attack happened, if she were stronger, if she were a better medic. The list went on and on. Half of the time she doubted if she was worthy of calling herself Kunoichi. She had seriously considered quitting many times for the last week, but she couldn't bring herself to actually do so, although that might have been just her fear of her mother's reaction to such news. Her mother was a strong woman, always knowing what to do, never backing off from a challenge, never taking any crap from anybody. Hannah wished she could be more like her. If her mother ever found out just how weak her daughter was, she would be extremely disappointed and let her opinion be known in a forceful manner. Hannah sighed. If she wasn't strong now, it didn't mean she couldn't become stronger. She resolved to devote her life to make it happen. She had thought she would have more time to prepare before she'll have to re-enter active duty, but then a message arrived saying she had been placed on a new squad. For a moment she had been tempted to refuse, but then she remembered her earlier resolve. If she wanted to become stronger, she should better begin now. Yet she felt very uncomfortable having to face new teammates so soon after losing her old ones. She had no desire to form new bonds when the wounds from the old ones being torn were still raw. But she couldn't back off now. She'll have to go and smile at strange people while her friends were lying dead in the ground. She looked up at the sky and noticed the hour. She should better be going. It wouldn't do to be late for her very first team meeting. She turned to leave, her three silent companions following he steps. Somewhere downtown she was ecstatic. After all the time she was finally placed on a new squad. She couldn't wait to see who her new teammates were going to be. She hoped they wouldn't be jerks like her old ones, who just went on with their lives and left her behind. They barely remembered to visit her in the hospital while she was still recovering. Not that she hated them, but they never became particularly close. They were both a bit spoiled kids from major clans, talented and among the best at the academy, while she was just a simple girl from a no-name family with no particular talent. Her only remarkable skill was in handling her kodachi her cousin had given her. She also taught her how to wield it. The short sword had become her love and pride. She polished it thoroughly, tested the sharpness of the blade and then sheathed it. She donned her customary ninja gear and set off to the training grounds. She couldn't wait to start a new era of her life. Tenzo's home Naruto couldn't sleep with excitement the night before. He had been even more hyper than usual ever since he had heard that he might become a real ninja. Sure, he first had to pass the genin test, but he was confident he could do it. Naturally it turned out to be harder than he imagined. 
he shuddered when he remembered it. Ninja Academy, two days earlier Naruto had never been at the academy before and he looked around in amazement. Never mind there wasn't much to see, every hallway, every closed door seemed to hold countless secrets of aspiring shinobi education and he couldn't help but wonder what skills would he have learned, what adventures he would have gone through, what friends and rivals he would have made had he attended here. But his musings were soon cut short, as they arrived at a particular door. Tenzo stopped and knocked. Come in, someone called. They entered a room. It was a standard classroom with a blackboard and rows of desks, only students were missing. Behind the teacher's desk was sitting a young man with grayish hair. Hello, he smiled in greeting. You must be Uzumaki Naruto. Pleased to meet you. I am Mizuki. I will be proctoring your test today. The teacher's politeness seemed forced, but it was better than what Naruto was used to. Pleased to meet you too, he replied. Well then. If you are prepared, take a seat and we shall begin the written portion. Written test? Naruto cringed inwardly. No matter how much Tenzo tutored him, book knowledge was never his forte. But he wouldn't back off. Not when his dream was within his reach. He put on a brave facade and sat down. Mizuki handed him a sheet of paper and a pen. You have an hour to complete it. You may begin now. Naruto turned the paper over and started reading the first question. It was hard, but he felt like he should know this, unfortunately the answer eluded him. He moved on to the second one. It was slightly easier. He started scribbling down what little he remembered. The hour passed in a similar fashion. Naruto managed to answer around half of the questions, some of them he knew, others he deduced. And where both failed, he just made something up and hoped some of it might hit close to the mark. He could just pray it would be enough to pass. Time's up, announced Mizuki and collected his test sheet. He briefly scanned it and looked vaguely pleased at something. Naruto just wished he knew whether it was at his success or failure. Now comes thrown weapon accuracy. Naruto perked up. That was something he excelled at, even if he said so himself. They arrived at the target range. Mizuki handed him a handful of practice kanai. Am I supposed to throw these? Naruto scowled. Of course, Mizuki said. Would you prefer to throw stones instead? Yes, the examinee confirmed. These are completely blunt and unbalanced. And are they even steel? They look like they'd shatter if I threw them too hard. So the standard academy equipment isn't good enough for you? Mizuki asked sarcastically. I'm afraid that's all you'll get here. If that's so, I understand why do the Jounin senseis always complain about new graduates, Tenzo stated his opinion. These are really inferior. Your poor students cannot possibly gain any accuracy working with those. Tell that to the council, Mizuki retorted. They refuse to raise our equipment budget again. I'm afraid those are all we have. Then it's good I packed my own, Naruto smiled reaching into his pouch. He then proceeded to throw his kanai and shuriken at the targets. He hit every one of them, only a handful went slightly off-center. Mizuki for a moment looked like he swallowed a lemon, but quickly corrected his facial expression. He wrote down Naruto's scores. You passed this one, he announced. Now we proceed to the Taijutsu exam. He had to spar against Mizuki. The man wasn't taking it easy on him, but Naruto was used to worse from Anko. Mizuki had to admit he was good enough to pass. The last portion was ninjutsu. When he was asked to perform kawarimi, he switched with Mizuki. The proctor had been startled and angered, but he had to admit it was a successful attempt. When performing henge he turned into Anko minus her coat. Mizuki was staring for a full minute before Tenzo decided that enough was enough and shook him awake. The teacher had to wipe the blood from his nose before he declared Naruto's attempt passable. 
The last obstacle before his becoming genin was the bunshin and ojutsu. He still couldn't do its most basic version properly, but he knew its upgrades. He quickly formed a hand seal and silently summoned a couple of kage bunshin. They appeared beside him and gave Mizuki a high five. That wasn't the correct hand seal sequence, Mizuki pointed out. But it gave the correct result, Naruto defended. Mizuki looked like he wanted to disagree, but he couldn't come up with a sound argument. You passed, he decided. Congratulations, Uzumaki, you are now officially a shinobi of Kanahagakure. Here is your Hitai 8. He handed him a rectangular piece of metal with the engraved leaf symbol fastened on a dark blue piece of cloth. Naruto took it reverently and carefully fastened it around his forehead. Then he sprung into a victorious dance. Yay, I did it, I did it. Calm down, Naruto, Tenzo chastised him, you're making a spectacle. Who cares? I did it. I did it. Tenzo sighed. When his young charge got into one of these moods, there were precious few things that could make him stop. You'll give Ninja of Kanoha bad name. That made the boy pause. Before he could come up with a reply, Tenzo pressed his advance. And if you do so, I won't buy you ramen. It was an underhanded tactics, but it was dependable. Tenzo used it strictly as a last resort, since it presented too much of a strain on his budget. But he felt this situation warranted it. Naruto forcibly calmed himself. I'll be good, he promised. They started towards Ichiraku's, Naruto's every step bouncing with barely suppressed excitement. Back at Tenzo's apartment Naruto was brought out of his reverie by the sight of the clock. Was it that late already? He put on his sandals and utility belt, and fastened the belt with his brand new ninjato over his blue and black jacket with orange trimming. Then he started roof hopping towards the training grounds. He wouldn't live it down if he started his ninja career by being late. Training grounds Tenzo was awoken from his musings by the sound of approaching footsteps. His students were coming. And it looked like they decided to show up at the same time. He jumped down from the tree. Time to put the show on the road. The team gathered under a tree. Tenzo eyed them curiously. His two new charges so far both were and weren't what he expected from reading their profiles. But he won't judge them until he got to know them better. So, ladies and gentlemen, he started, now that we are all here, we should begin with the introductions. I guess I should go first myself. So for those who don't know me yet, my name is Tenzo and I'm your new sensei. I specialize in ninjutsu and kenjutsu. Now you, he pointed to a slim girl in a short purple kimono. She was trying to keep a solemn demeanor, but her excitement shone through. I am Yuzuki Hataru, she began. I specialize in kenjutsu as well, she pointed to the sword handle visible behind her shoulder. Her deep purple ponytail whipped around her head. I want to someday become as good as my cousin. I wish I could be such an awesome kunoichi as her. Why do you want to be so awesome? The other girl scoffed derogatorily. She was a muscular brunette clad in black shorts, red form-fitting sleeveless top and beige leather vest with fur on its hems. She also had two long red triangles running down her cheeks and was accompanied by three gray wolfish dogs. She also seemed to be spreading an aura of gloom, which her new teammates valiantly resisted. Hataru scowled at her. You think you're already awesome, clan brat? Enough, Tenzo cut them off before an argument could start. You're a team now, so act like it. And for those, who don't know what it entails, that means no fighting each other. Understood? Nobody said a word. That's good. Now let's get back to the introductions. Why don't you go next, he pointed to the dog girl. My name is Inazuka Hana. I specialize in my clan's techniques and medical jutsu. I want. I just want to be good. Tenzo wondered what it was she wanted to say originally. And now the last one, he pointed to his charge. 
Naruto nearly jumped with excitement. I am Uzumaki Naruto. I'm good at ninjutsu and taijutsu too and I want to learn kenjutsu but I'm no good at genjutsu and I want to. Slow down, squirt, Hannah interrupted. Nobody's interested in your ramblings. Have you even started the academy yet? What? Naruto shouted insulted. If we weren't banned from fighting, I'd show you just what a ninja I am. Silence, the two of you, Tenzo commanded. Hannah, I know what had happened to you, but please try to be more tolerant. It may be news to you, but you aren't the only one with a bad experience. I know it's still too soon, but you'll have to deal with it, otherwise it will disrupt your progress. Hannah just scowled. Who was he to tell her that? And her new teammates, she just couldn't stand their happy carefree attitudes. They were such children, especially the short boy. It didn't help at all that he reminded her of Jubiai a bit. But Jubiai was dead, his life leaving him under her hands, and this brat here was very much alive, annoying her with his chipper attitude. She wanted to wring his neck. Now the introductions are over, we'll go on to the next order of business, and this is your team's test. Naruto looked at him startled, Hataru attentively, Hana just stared at the ground. A little more enthusiasm wouldn't hurt, he advised her. She scowled but turned to him. As the girls present know, every new team is being given a test to see whether they are suited to be ninja or should be sent back to the academy, in your case to the reserves. Those tests vary from sensei to sensei. I don't know what sort of tests you already passed, but here is mine. Here is a scroll. It contains the information on what you'll have to do to pass. I'm going to hide it somewhere in this training area. You may start searching for it in ten minutes exactly. And remember, from the moment the test starts, you are in hostile territory. He melted into the nearest tree. The expressions on the girl's faces were hilarious. He didn't linger long. He had a scroll to hide. He took off, all the while wondering how his genin will do. Back with the team, so how are we going to go about this? Naruto asked. I'm not sure I want to give it a go, Hannah muttered. Her teammates glared at her. Of course, clan princess can afford to fail, Hataru huffed. There's no way they wouldn't give her another team. The three dogs growled menacingly. Cut it, girls, Naruto snapped. Have you already forgotten, what Tenzo-sensei said? No fighting. Besides we have the test to worry about. Knowing Tenzo, it isn't going to be easy. You know him? Hataru asked. Yes, Naruto confirmed. What can you tell us about him? Hana seemed to have overcome her funk and went down to business. He's very good. I've never saw him in a real battle but he's strong and fast and he can really use his sword. He has water, earth and wood ninjutsu. Wood? Hana asked surprised. Wasn't that the Shodai's unique ability? Yes, Naruto confirmed, but it isn't so unique anymore. I can't really tell you more about this. Can't or won't? Hataru inquired. Shouldn't we get back to business? Naruto avoided answering. Tenzo will probably hide the scroll in a tree somewhere, but then it could be underground as well or dot well, elsewhere. Thanks for the help, the Inazuka muttered sarcastically. I have yet to see you offer some, Naruto retorted. That's true, Hataru added. Can your dogs sniff out the scroll? Is there any doubt? Hana took offense. They are Inazuka clan ninja dogs. They can smell anything from several miles away. That's well, then, the youngest member of the squad grinned. We'll find the scroll in no time. We, brat? I'll find it, Hannah scowled. It was becoming a habit of hers. Calm down, both of you, Hataru interrupted them. We are supposed to be a team, remember? Yes, Hannah scoffed. The ten minutes are almost up. So how do we start? 
Let's just split up and divide the area to search, the purple-haired girl suggested. That way we can search it through faster. I don't know, Naruto mused. Tenzo said we're in hostile territory. We should stick together in case of an attack. Hannah stiffened. Those words brought back memories of the ambush. With them, the doubts and self-accusations returned with a vengeance. If they had just stuck together. Hey, Hannah, what's up with you? the boy asked. She woke up from her reverie. Nothing, she stated with a glare, daring him to disagree. Are you sure? He did it anyway, with that disturbingly cute concerned look on that childish face of his. Yes. And we should get moving. The test starts just about dot now. She stood up and gestured to her dogs. They obediently took the front and inhaled the air. The middle one barked. This way, Hannah commanded and took off. The team followed her. They ran on the ground for a couple hundred steps, then they took to the treetops. Naruto was surprised that Hannah's dogs jumped on the branches too. You taught them to climb trees, he asked in amazement. What next, would you teach them to meow? What did you just say? Hannah barked. That you are retraining your dogs to become cats, the shortest Jenin clarified. Hannah stopped on the spot. Never, ever insult an Inazuka's dog, she growled. Okay, okay, I apologize, Naruto threw his arms up in a peace gesture. I was just joking. I didn't mean anything bad. You better, the dog mistress advised him, because it's a stupid joke and I don't appreciate such. Look out, Hataru shouted. It was the only warning they had before a kunai with an already lit exploding tag landed in the middle of their group. They leapt away to avoid the blast. That had been too close for comfort. The kimono-clad girl unsheathed her blade. Some instinct made her slash behind her. Her sword cut into a wooden figurine with a smiling face and lodged itself in its chest. She tried to pull it out, but it proved to be an impossible task. Then she had to abandon it altogether, because another wooden man came at her from behind. It was fast. She somehow avoided its first strike, but found herself in the path of another blow. She braced herself for the impact. It never came. A blue and black blur suddenly appeared and slammed into the doll, knocking it off the branch. Are you all right? Naruto asked. She nodded. Where is Hana? The Inazuka and her dogs were currently battling two figurines. They were holding their own, but they couldn't gain any advantage either. I'll take the one on the left and you the one on the right, Naruto decided. He didn't wait for her response and charged. Hothead, Hataru muttered. Then she jumped into the fray as well. Their attack lacked coordination, but their superior numbers prevailed eventually. But they had to admit grudgingly that they could have done much better. No more goofing off, Hannah decided. We'll have to take it seriously from now on, which means no jokes, Naruto. You just needed cheering up, the blonde replied defensively. Spare it for later, the kunoichi advised. Now we have to be alert. This is what we'll do. I'll take the point with my dogs and would search for the scroll and more enemies. You two will be covering my flanks. Hataru will be on the right and Naruto on the left. Understood? They both confirmed. Let's go then. This time they were going slower. They strained all their senses to detect another ambush in time. But none happened. Suddenly Hannah stopped. We're close, she whispered. Where is it? Naruto asked. That way, she pointed straight ahead, but I see a wire. There are traps. I expected nothing less, the short boy replied. I wouldn't try. Disarming them, that usually makes them spring. Bypassing them is a better option, but there's always something hidden. This requires extreme caution. No kidding, Hannah agreed. 
His scent is all over this place. I doubt there even is a safe way in. Then we'll just have to make one, Naruto proposed. And how would you accomplish that? Hataru questioned. I'll make clones and send them in, the aspiring shinobi explained his plan. A lot of them would be destroyed, but eventually one will get through. And you can make that much corporeal clones? Hannah doubted. Yes, the boy confirmed. Look. He lifted his hands in a familiar seal and soon the branches around them were obscured in smoke. When it cleared, a hundred little blonde ninja appeared. Wow, Hataru whistled. Idiot, Hannah chastised him. Who told you to do it now and here? You could have sprung a trap and alerted our enemies. The youth looked ashamed. What's done is done, the dog user continued. We'll go with your plan, but try not to trip any traps if you can avoid it. Roger, Naruto said. Then he motioned for a clone to begin. The replica slowly started forward. It made a few steps before stopping to study something on the ground. Then he jumped high. He landed in a crouch and was promptly destroyed by a rising wooden spike. Second clone followed in his footsteps and met the same end. The third tried jumping further. He fell into a pit with spikes on the bottom. Fourth clone found a log somewhere. He threw it on the place where his predecessors faced their demise. Spikes came again from the ground, but there was nobody to hit. The shadow clone ran atop the log and then jumped over the pit. He was surprised when he landed safely. Unfortunately when he made a single step, his foot was caught in a noose and he was hauled upwards. He hung there upside down for a moment before disappearing in a puff of smoke. It took most of the clones and far more time than they had anticipated, but eventually one of the replicas got his hand on the scroll and threw it to the original before a blast note destroyed him. Finally, Naruto rejoiced. Let's open it, Hataru demanded. It could be another trap, Hana pointed out. You're right, Naruto agreed and handed the suspicious scroll to one of his few remaining clones. It wasn't a trap and the clone opened it without any trouble. What does it say? Hataru inquired. The clone gave her the scroll before dispelling itself. She quickly read through its contents, Hannah looking over her shoulder. That doesn't sound hard, she commented. Just deliver it to the other side of the village. But we have a time limit and we're still in enemy territory, the single male of the team reminded them. That could be a problem, the purple-haired Kunoichi agreed. You bet it will be, Naruto remarked. So who should carry the scroll? Obvious choice is the strongest, but that's kinda too obvious. We could try also the fastest, but I personally think it should be the sneakiest. But Tenzo already knows that trick. So what do we do? A short while later the team exited the training grounds. They were surprised when nobody attacked them on the way out. They agreed it was probably because they had already fought at the forest once and their test proctor didn't want to be repetitive. It just meant they would have to be extra careful in the village. They opted to walk through the busiest streets. It was slow, but they figured that they wouldn't be assaulted in a crowd of civilians. Their most pressing concern was now making it in time. Hannah walked at the point looking feral and scowling. Her three canines surrounded her with their teeth bared. People were giving the group a wide berth. The normalcy of the city life was slowly lulling them into letting their guards down, but they resisted it with all their might. Unfortunately that wasn't very much. Therefore they missed the drunkard stumbling through the crowd until she bumped into Hataru. Srey, girl, did not mean to, the woman slurred. Nothing happened, the girl replied trying to pry the wino's dirty hands off her. Really did not mean to, the drunk repeated. I know, I know, lady. Now please let go off me. Hataru was beginning to lose patience, but then the woman suddenly let go of her. Thanks, the kunoichi muttered. The drunkard shot them one last glance and the crowd swallowed her. Naruto noticed something in her face, 
something disturbingly familiar. Was it a hint of a smirk? Anko, he realized. What? Hannah didn't understand his sudden outburst. The scroll. Do you still have it? He turned to Hataru. Of course I. She stole it. The purple-haired sword wielder was furious. She's gone now, her young teammate observed. What do we do? Sniff her out, of course, Hannah proclaimed. That might not be that easy, Naruto pointed out. Never underestimate an Inazuka's nose, Hannah smirked and without further ado started tracking. Never underestimate Anko, the blonde corrected, but his female teammates paid him no heed. Unfortunately it turned out Naruto was right, it really wasn't so easy. The trail led right through a puddle of spilled perfume. All four Inazukas started sneezing. Told you so, Naruto couldn't resist saying. Hannah shot him a murderous glare. Elsewhere a figure ran over the rooftops. He paused for a brief moment, scanned his surroundings, then took off again in a different direction. He was close now. His target was just a few streets over, moving through the daily traffic completely unaware of its pursuer. He sped up for a bit, then halted. There, target in sight. He crouched down to devise an attack strategy. Dango Shop Anko sat down in the comfortable chair and stretched her legs lazily. She inhaled the heavenly smell of the dumpling stick in her hand, then bit it down and savored its taste. She felt like she deserved the treat, no matter that her task had been ridiculously easy. The kitties didn't even know what had hit them. Well, to be honest, Naruto had recognized her, but he had been too late. She had already disappeared in the crowd. Too bad that she didn't get to see their cute little faces when they found out, but nobody got all their wishes. Oh well, at least there always was her precious trusty Dango to console her. Hey, lady, an obnoxious voice rudely brought her out of her fantasies. She turned to look at the perpetrator. It was a rather good-looking man, if it wasn't for the lecherous smirk on his face. She immediately took a strong dislike towards him. What are you doing here all alone? None of your business, she hissed, clearly indicating she wasn't interested. He was either very stupid or very brave, because he didn't back off. Her guess was on the first. Beautiful young ladies like you shouldn't be sitting alone, the bloke stated sitting down beside her. She narrowed her eyes dangerously. I'm no lady and you'll be very sorry, if you don't get lost now. Most people would be running for their lives before she finished her sentence, but not this guy. My, my, aren't we in a sour mood tonight, the man chided. But don't despair, I'm going to cheer you up. She had enough. She punched the sucker. He fell to the ground clutching his wounded cheek. Strong hands suddenly grabbed her. Military police. You're arrested for public brawling. She froze. She hadn't even realized they were there. And Kanoha's police force generally didn't like her. She was in trouble. Then she felt a hand wandering under her coat. What are you? She started when the hand suddenly withdrew. She caught a glimpse of something sailing through the air. The scroll. A hand caught it in the air. She noticed the whirl of a long brown ponytail, then the person melted into the crowd. She kicked the two policemen. They disappeared in twin puffs of smoke. Shadow clones. The man who had hit on her was gone as well. Figures. No. She shouted. She couldn't believe that she had been fooled by such a lame trick. She ran into the street and gave pursuit, but the culprits had masked their tracks well. City Park, did we make it? a breathless Naruto asked. Though he could boast the greatest stamina of all the squad, he also possessed the shortest legs and had to work hard to keep up with his female companions. Yes, you did, Tenzo answered appearing from a tree. And with a minute to spare. We didn't have to go so fast, the youngest Jenin complained. Shut up, Hannah suggested. There are you, an enraged female voice shouted. 
Calm down, Anko, they've already finished. Game's over, the Mokutan user said. I'll get you next time, the snake mistress promised. Well now everybody's here, we can evaluate your work, Tenzo announced. The three genin tensed. We'll start at the beginning. You had full ten minutes to prepare a strategy, but you wasted it arguing instead. That's just the sort of thing that would get you killed. On a real mission. The threesome looked abashed. And then you just rushed forward without a real plan. You didn't even look out for trouble. Again, you would have been dead. This sort of recklessness can be expected, though not acceptable, from a fresh genin like Naruto, but you girls had been in the field before, you really should have known better. Now they looked downtrodden. Then the attack. You were arguing among yourselves instead of paying attention to your surroundings. Do I have to say what could that cost you? Though on a positive note, you showed something akin to teamwork during the battle, but it could have been already too late. Well, what do you have to say for yourselves? Well do better next time, Naruto offered. In real life, there is no next time, Tenzo reminded him. The boy returned to studying his feet. Let's move forward. Disarming the traps. Naruto, you acted without the consent of your comrades. Do you think you are the team leader? No, the little blonde answered. Then you can't afford to do such a thing. It doesn't matter that it worked this time, it could land you in a world of trouble any time. Although I suppose telling you this has little effect and you'll have to learn the hard way. The boy refrained from answering. Then comes the second part of the test. You finally got it to your heads that you have to move information, but you weren't careful enough. What does it say about your situational awareness, if you get pickpocketed so easily? Naruto pointedly glanced at Anko. She scowled back. But getting the scroll back like that was ingenious. Not many people can pull one over Anko like that. May I ask how did you manage to locate her? Trade secret, Naruto declared with a foxy grin. He had transformed a couple of his shadow clones into bugs and hid them within the scroll. When it had been stolen, one of them dispelled, letting him know where Anko had stopped. Did it have something to do with the clone keeping watch from the rooftops? Tenzo guessed. I thought I lost that one, Anko said. Not really, Naruto answered. Then how? Anko inquired. Now, now, the boy smirked. What kind of ninja would I be if I revealed my secrets? Well then, keep your secrets, the older man decided. The last part, your action against Anko. Nice teamwork there. I guess there is yet some hope for you. The three genin looked at him in askance. Congratulations, he smiled, you three passed. Yay! Naruto jumped in elation. Hataru punched the air. Hana just smiled, her dogs barked and wagged their tails. You can take the rest of the day off, get to know each other and enjoy life while you still can, advise their sensei, because tomorrow your training starts. Meet me at the training grounds at sunrise and don't be late. His proclamation did nothing to sour his genin's mood. Well, they'll find out what they've gotten into soon enough. Kanoha Hospital Hana visited her sensei. He technically wasn't her sensei anymore, but she still thought of him as such. I've been placed on a new team, Yagi Sensei, she announced after the formalities were out of the way. Well, that's good. But isn't it too soon? I feel like it is, the girl admitted. But I guess it had to happen sooner or later, so why not just deal with it sooner? Good approach there, her old sensei smiled approvingly. So how are they? They're not them, she answered. Of course not, the bedridden man agreed. They can never be. I know that myself. But what are they like otherwise? Our new sensei seems to be a no-nonsense kind of guy. He gave us a tough test, much tougher than yours, but we passed, the dog mistress told him. And your teammates? Yagi wanted to know. Well, 
first there's Hataru. She seemed like an airhead at first, but she turned out to be actually somewhat competent. Then there's the little kid, Naruto. He looks barely old enough to start the academy, but he knows his business. I feared he would be one of the snotty prodigy types, but he behaves like a hyper idiot. He reminds me of Jubiai a bit. But he's not, the man stated. Exactly. I know how hard it is for you, but you can't get stuck in the past, he advised not for the first time. Your new team sounds actually quite likable. Learn to appreciate them for who they are instead of comparing them with the dead. I know, sensei, and I'm trying, she sighed. Honestly. But it's not as easy as it sounds. Isn't that the truth, he said sagely. I've been in the same spot before. I pulled trough, but I've seen many who didn't. And believe me, you don't want to end up like them. A faraway look entered his eyes. You really don't want to end up like them. I don't, she confirmed. I'll try comparing the squirt with my little brother instead. Thinking of it, they are somewhat alike. Now that's the spirit, her sensei smiled. And now, don't waste any more of your time on an old geezer like me. Go and catch up with your new teammates and family. Thank you. I think I'll do just that. She left the hospital room with a lighter heart. The tree hideout Naruto was for once just lounging around, appreciating the quiet of the sunny afternoon. He made Jenin, he had a team, everything was perfect in the world. It took him a while to realize he wasn't alone. Tenzo, he greeted the newcomer. Or should I call you sensei now? Just when we're in public, his guardian answered. So, how do you like your new team? Hannah's too gloomy, the foxy boy said, but Hataru's fine. Don't be harsh to her, the older man defended her. She had something bad happen to her recently. She isn't over it yet. What happened to her? Naruto was curious. It's not my place to tell. You should be worrying about team's training instead. What's to worry about? I've trained with you for years. Tenzo just smiled enigmatically. Naruto started to worry. Hataru's home she wasn't too surprised. When she found her cousin waiting for her. So how was your new team's first meeting, the older Kunoichi asked. About as good as expected, the younger girl replied. We passed the test, by the way. Congratulations, then, the woman smiled. Your new sensei isn't wasting any time. Who is it, anyway? Some guy named Tenzo. Tenzo, you Gugo wondered. I'm surprised they gave him a team. Why? Hataru demanded. Is there something wrong with him? No, the older girl shook her head, you're in good hands, but he already had an apprentice. A young boy. That sounds like one of my new teammates. So how do you like them? You Gugo wanted to know. Are they stuffed up pricks like your old team? I don't think so, she answered. At least Naruto isn't. I'm not so sure about Hannah. Well I don't really know her, but she didn't strike me as the type, you Gugo said. She is probably just depressed now. What about, the younger girl wanted to know. Not my place to tell, but it's a sound reason to be depressed. Now we should go celebrate your success, because if Tenzo haven't suddenly gone soft, you won't feel like celebrating for a long time to come. Hokage's office Sarutobi was reading the report his analysts have provided with a frown. It stated that one of the slain ninja had been from IWA, the other from Kiri. So far what can be expected from a bunch of nuke nin. But the part about their equipment was worrisome. Their weapons have been crafted in the same workshop and it wasn't one Kanoha's experts recognized. It might mean nothing. Somebody might have just opened a new store and served all clientele. But it could also be more sinister. There might even be a new village being founded and they had already proven hostile towards Kanoha. And this had to happen at the same time some disturbing info came about the Uchiha clan. 
He didn't want to believe they were really disloyal, but then they have always been power-hungry and arrogant to boot. For a countless time he wished there were someone younger worrying about this instead of him. But it wasn't to be. His successor got himself killed and his three students turned out useless in their own unique ways. In his worst moments he even considered just giving the hat to Danzo, but it never lasted long. He sighed and started writing a message. He'll send Jiraiya to investigate. He just prayed it won't turn out to be too much trouble for his old bones to handle. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.